Joining me now is Dennis Wall from the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford University. So Dennis, can you tell me a little bit about your work with autism? Yes, we are a lab that's working on a number of different modalities to try to improve detection and um, understand the molecular pathology of autism. But the work that I talked about today is primarily in the area of understanding how we can leverage home videos and short parent questionnaires to dramatically reduce the time complexity associated with the initial detection of autism and get children in to clinical uh, visits much faster than they currently can today. Does that mean you could potentially diagnose someone with autism from a YouTube video? I think right now the best that we can say is that using YouTube videos, and this is pretty good by the way, the best that we can say using YouTube videos is that we can provide a quantitative probability of the child's risk for autism that clinicians can use and, and, and react to. For clinical triage, for example, there are kids that have clear-cut symptomatologies that can be diagnosed in minutes, and they're not being diagnosed in minutes, and they're also on this long waiting list with many other kids who are clinically challenging. If they can be diagnosed in a few minutes and we can provide mechanisms to enable that, they should be diagnosed in, in, in five minutes. Now, what drew you to the field of autism research? Um, a number of things, starting with um, family. My sister-in-law is severely autistic and I've known her since I was a teenager, my, my wife's sister. <clears throat> and so I've always been, I've been able to, to watch firsthand what it, what it means to have uh, an individual in a family with autism, what it means for the family, what it means for the individual and so forth. And I wanted to figure out ways to help. Also, the other reason is I'm a systems medicine specialist. I work in computational genomics and bioinformatics. <clears throat> and I feel like given the complexity of autism, there's a lot of opportunity to make big gains using these kinds of methods to interpret the, the sort of genetic complexity of autism as well as the behavioral complexity of autism and find ways to combine the two to create more precise diagnostic measures. With autism, you could come up with a risk profile. So a doctor could look at a video of a patient and say, wow, you may be at risk for ADHD or for mild cognitive impairment. Well, I think that, yes, if we have the right kind of data, in many cases we do, and we're starting to explore this, can we reapply the same paradigm to, let's say, ADHD? Then we will provide not just a video, but really a quantitative score to the clinicians that says, here's this child who's a lot like these children. So it's like, a patient's like mine kind of situation where they can see within this distribution whether the child's probability of risk warrants something um, like a, a you know an immediate diagnosis, a specific kind of therapy, or you know a more clinical, a more typical standard of care clinical evaluation given the complexity of the symptoms and the, and the indication provided by the score. The scoring system that we develop provides really a um, a margin of confidence. What does a margin of confidence mean for your average person? Uh, so the scores for this stuff that we've built for autism not only tell you whether the, there's risk for autism, mm -hmm. but it tells you how confident you should be in that risk probability. So if it's close to the borderline of a diagnostic distinction from like not autism to autism, then we have low confidence. And so that provides the doctors sort of an immediate indication, okay, this child is clinically challenging. Uh, the number that I'm getting indicates risk for autism, but it's a very small number, and that means I should look more carefully, maybe request another video. Hmm. And so it, it, it really, you know, captures a lot more than just yes or no. It provides, inter, you know, it provides sort of an inherent understanding of the severity of the phenotype and the confidence you should have in the profile provided. So this really might change the way we diagnose these things. I think it can channel traffic really well, right? Right now the waiting lists for kids, uh, the, the, the number of kids on waiting lists exceed like 500 in many, wow. in many um, centers. And that can translate into 13 months, 18 months of waiting. And by the time they get through the door, they've already lost opportunities. And so if we can instrument those clinical sites with the mechanism to drive traffic down one path versus another, it'll open the bottlenecks. So in other words, the kid that most need to be looked at more closely can be with this sort of data. Absolutely, and I think the kids that clinicians can react to automatically as a waiting room diagnosable child will be able to do so kind of automatically as opposed to waiting for them to come through that waiting list on a first, uh, first come, first served basis. Great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me.